there you go. Right, so we're carrying on with the, the Lord's Prayer. Um, and this, I've called it part three, but I'll put that in, in inverted commas because actually uh, Sue is going to be uh, preaching. <gasps> A woman preaching? Surely not. <laughs> um, and she's going to be uh, talking about the give us this day our daily bread bit. So it's kind of, I'm going to skip that bit today. Um, remember why we're doing this. We have taken this uh, passage from the Bible, which says the student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. Um, now, I do have a tendency to teach when I'm preaching. <laughs> That's my style, because I was a teacher. Um, but this, this is a great excuse for teaching, because we want to be more like our teacher, Jesus. Um, so over the last couple of talks, I'll just give you a brief rundown of what, what I've been talking about. Um, importantly, prayer develops our relationship with God. Uh, it's not just a list of requests. Um, and remember I gave you some advice about finding a, a quiet place to pray, um, to pause and focus before you start, and to keep things simple and real, just like Dave was saying earlier as we were praying, God knows we, we want to be real with God, and to keep it up, don't give up. And the last time I spoke to you, I spoke to you about uh, from the first part of the Lord's Prayer, uh, pointing out that we were made to glorify God and enjoy him forever. So Christians shouldn't be miserable. Yeah. <laughs> we are here to glorify God and enjoy him. I reminded us that we can call the creator of the universe Daddy, <coughs> which is amazing, but also that he is an amazing God in heaven. And it reminded us also that we can, if we want to see what God's like, see the Father, how can we do that? Well, we can read about Jesus, because Jesus is God. And finally, I encouraged us to seek his kingdom first, not our kingdom, and to listen to his voice and do what he tells us to do. Yeah. So today I'm going to look at the next bit of the Lord's Prayer, which is, um, well, so the bit after, not the daily bread, but the bit after, which is, forgive our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Okay. So one of the most important things um, in our Christian faith is that we believe that when Jesus died on that cross, all our sins are forgiven if we put our trust in Jesus. That's all your sins, past, present, future. Okay. So why do we need to keep asking for forgiveness? Well, I don't know about you, but we are not perfect. Um, if you pray the Lord's Prayer every day, which I'm trying to encourage you to do, then every day we're going to ask for forgiveness for our sins. And that's because we are a broken, messed up lot. And we do not live a completely free, sin-free life. I, I remember very clearly um, in a previous church in Biggin Hill, I did ask one of the elders I respected very greatly. I, I asked him once, I said, do you think that as Christians on this earth, we can live a sin-free life? I was expecting the answer, no, of course not. He actually said yes. So think about that one. I'm not sure about that one. One for debate. Um, just a little word about words. Uh, because you can see on the board there, um, uh, we've got this word sins, but traditionally we, call, we say trespasses, don't we? or debts. Um, and I think I'm coming round to the idea of debts. I think I prefer the word debts because 
Debt means that we owe something. Who do we owe it to? We owe it to God. Um, my sort of ingrainedness means my, when I'm praying this, I always pray sins. And I think it take a long time to actually change that to debts. But I think debts is a good word. The other thing I want you to notice is throughout the Lord's Prayer, it says words like we and our and us. And I think this is really important. It's not something I've particularly noticed before. And just looking at this, I realise actually this is important because it's, it's emphasising the corporate nature of the body of Christ. It's not I, it's not me, it's we and us. And it makes me feel like you know, we, we're looking out for each other. I think, you know, we've, we've been here, what, seven years or eight years, I'm not sure now. And we've developed this, and I mean it, and I don't mean it lightly, we've <clears throat> developed this sense of family. We've developed this sense of looking out for each other. And I think it's a beautiful thing. And I think it's a rare thing. And I, I think this prayer kind of emphasises that, that we are looking out for each other. Um, now, I just want to move on to what Paul says. Now, with this passage that I'm about to show you and read out, um, there's some debate about whether it was Paul actually saying it about himself or if he was saying it about somebody else or a general thing. I don't think it matters really because I think it makes me feel nice and humble. It's from Romans 7, verse 18 to 25. This is Paul saying, For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am! <laughs> Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Can I have an amen? <laughs> or a hallelujah, or whatever you want. <laughs> That's amazing news, isn't it? Yeah. So Jesus has rescued us from this body that is subject to death. So Paul is pointing out, really, I think, that we are all subject to sinning, which is why we need to ask for forgiveness every day. But remember where this comes in the, in the um, Lord's Prayer? It's not at the beginning. And I think I mentioned to you last time that when I first became a Christian, I'd go straight for, oh, forgive me, Lord, I've done that wrong. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have thought that. That's not where God wants it. That's not where Jesus put it in the Lord's Prayer. He put it after all the good things. What do we start with? Our Father. Yeah. So I think that's really important as you do pray out the Lord's Prayer. But when you do come to this part about forgiveness, I think it's really helpful to actually ask the Holy Spirit to reveal any sin that's in your heart. Because sometimes, sometimes we just don't want God to know about our sins. We know he does, but we don't want to discuss it with him. So... Ask the Holy Spirit to help you when you pray this bit. Have you ever heard somebody say, I can never forgive myself for what I said, what I did, what I thought? Well, that might sound all, you know, you're being very spiritual here. You can't forgive yourself. 
but actually you're wrong. <laughs> okay? um, we don't have any right not to forgive ourselves. Who can forgive us? Jesus. Yes, absolutely, Jesus. Yeah. We don't have that right not to forgive ourselves. Only God can not forgive us. Does he not forgive us? No, he doesn't. Lots of negatives there, but you know what I mean. <laughs> so, what about the hard bit? Forgiving others. Um, recently, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, uh, commented on forgiveness. Um, he was focusing on social media. He said, the absence of forgiveness in our world, in our country, is absolutely appalling. You post something stupid when you're 19, and you pay for it when you're 35, and you keep on paying for it forever. Social media connects us in a way that we've never imagined possible, but also works to drive us even further apart. And one of the things I've noticed in my short life, because I'm very young, is that it's not just social media where there seems to be a lack of forgiveness. If you see people who, who've had loved ones killed, um, or somebody has been wrongly accused of something, quite often they say, I want justice. And if you think about it, what they're actually saying is, I want revenge. Yeah. Um, everybody's looking for something or someone to blame. I just want to tell you a little story, really, uh, about a guy who's got the same surname as me, or had the same surname as me, which is why I kind of noticed it. It must be related, because there's not many misms in the world. Um, there's a few in South East London, which is where Jimmy Mism lived. I'm just going to read this out. It says, Jimmy Mism was murdered in May 2008. And just looking at this, I've found out that his killer has just been released last year, after 14 years. He and his older brother went into a bakery near their home in Lee, South East London, that's near Lewisham, so you probably know the area. While inside, Jake, who had been cautioned by police several years earlier for harassing Jimmy's older sibling, brushed past the brothers. A scuffle followed, resulting in Jake hurling a glass dish at Jimmy, which fatally wounded him. Jimmy's parents, Barry and Margaret Mism, hit national headlines when immediately after the attack, they spoke of compassion rather than revenge. Jimmy's mum said this, I was asked by all the press and media present how I felt. I've always thought that's a silly question to ask, but that's what they say. And I heard myself saying that I hoped the parents of Jimmy's ki killer would be left alone as it wasn't their fault. I said I didn't feel anger because anger breeds anger and that is what killed our son and could destroy our family too. The days that followed were surreal. We didn't understand what happened or how to react. The house was full of people and the table stacked with food people brought over. There was this immediate outpouring of grief, but with it came a huge outpouring of love too. As terrible as the tragedy was, we felt blessed to have so much love in our lives. Love and prayer is what kept us going. I'm not shouting from the rooftop, I forgive, but by not wanting revenge, I have an inner peace that a lot of people in our position don't seem to have. Jimmy's murder has done a lot of damage to this family, and I can't let it do any more. That's an amazing story, and I think you know, that is such a, an encouragement to us. I just want to tell you one more story before we can do a little... Sketch. This is a story that Jesus told. Um, it's from um, Matthew 18, 21 to 25. It's a bit long, so I'm not going to put it on the board, on the screen. So if you have a Bible, you can follow it. If not, just listen. It says, Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, 
Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold and to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. He, be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, cancelled the debt and let him go. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay back the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I cancelled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant, just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how your heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. So I don't think I need to add any more to that. Let's have a, a little drama. And I have my friend Caramir who's going to come up. He doesn't need a microphone. <laughs> So this is, um, I actually put it on the WhatsApp um, yesterday, you may have seen it. It's, it's a drama about the Lord's Prayer. It's a lady who starts to pray the Lord's Prayer, and God actually starts to say some things as well. And of course, I am playing God. <laughs> so we're going to just do the introduction bit and then we're going to jump, we're going to cut a bit out because it's quite long and we'll go to the, the bit about forgiving others. So over to you, Caramel. Our Father, who art in heaven. Yes. Don't interrupt me, I'm praying. But you called me. Called you? I didn't call you. I was praying, our Father, who art in heaven. There, you did it again. Did what? You called me. You said, our Father, who art in heaven. Here I am. What's on your mind? But I didn't mean anything by it. I, I was, you know, just saying my prayers for the day. I always say the Lord's Prayer and it makes me feel good. Oh. Sort of getting the job done. I see. Okay, go on. And we're going to skip to the bit where we're praying for forgiveness. This is, I'm going to stop. Praying is a dangerous thing. You could end up changed, you know. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to bring across to you. You called me, and here I am. It's too late now to stop. Keep on praying. I'm interested in the next part of your prayer. I'm scared to. Scared of what? I know what you're going to say. Oh, try me and see. <laughs> forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. Okay, what about Peter Jenkins? You see, what you bring up. Why Lord and told lies about me and he changed the, up the, the, he stole some money from me and I swear I'll get even with him. Well, well, what about your prayer? I didn't mean it. Ah, at least you're honest. But it's not much fun carrying around that load of bitterness inside, is it? I agree. But I feel better. I feel better as soon as I get even with you. <laughs> I have some plans for old Peter. <laughs> you won't feel any better. In fact, you'll feel worse. Revenge isn't sweet. Think of how unhappy you really are. But I'll change all that. 
You will? I'll. Forgive Peter. Then I'll forgive you. Then the hate and sin will be Peter's problem and not yours. You may lose the money, but you will have settled your heart. That doesn't sound easy, but deep down I know it would be worth the effort. Thank you, Lord, for helping me work through the steps. Amen. <laughs> You. And you can get that on um, the internet. So it's, it's cool. um, I think that that drama is suggesting that forgiving others makes us feel better. Now that might be true, but it isn't why we forgive others. We forgive others because we are told to. Um, it's not an option. Um, so just a couple of examples. Am I doing for time? Oh, not too bad. Um, a while ago, I had some people. We had some people around for drinks and snacks, as we do occasionally. Um, and then, one point in the evening, I said something, and um, one of our guests really had a go at me. It was it was quite shocking, actually. I was quite taken aback. You know what I'm like. I'm not a, I'm a, a aggressive or confrontational person. But he really had a go at me. I knew that I would never get an apology from him for what he said, even though I was sure I was completely in the right and he was completely in the wrong. So instead of seething and never seeing him again, which is what I wanted to do, I took the advice of an elder at Biggin Hill who many, many years ago said what he did when he had a similar situation. He said, "Bring him, take him round a bottle of wine, which is what I did. Took him around an expensive bottle of wine um, and he was so touched and taken back by that that um, yeah, he, we restored the friendship that we had. So I forgave him. And he forgave me. Um, the last bit, uh, the last, my last story, I think it's my last story, um, is quite personal. And as I was saying earlier, you know, I do feel that we are family and I feel I can relate this to. Many of you know that I have did go through a period of depression some 10 years ago or 11 years ago. And this is the background to it. Um, in my last year of teaching at the school, I was, at, I was in a difficult situation. I was head of a small department um, and I had one of the staff members off for, on maternity leave. Another member of the team um, seemed to need a lot more support than I was able to offer. I'm not quite sure what her problem was, but um, she wasn't happy. So I had a whole series of supply teachers. So these are teachers that come in from the outside and know nothing about the school. They needed a lesson plan. They needed me to mark the, the homework that they set. Um, and a lot of them really couldn't control the classes. So they needed me, not that I was brilliant, but they needed me in the classroom to help them with their classroom control. And I was teaching and doing everything else. So instead of getting some help from my senior management team, the head deputy head actually started criticising me and he threatened to discipline me for incompetency. And I'd been there for 16 years at that school and didn't have any problems before. It was later on that I learned that the deputy head had done this sort of thing with other members of staff to try and get rid of them because the older members of staff, like me, have been there quite a long time, 16 years, were actually pretty well paid. It was an independent school. Um, I didn't know that at the time. It led me to completely lose my confidence in teaching, um, resulted in a time of depression, and I actually left teaching after um, sort of 10 years before I was due to leave. When I understood that God had commanded me to forgive those who sin against me, it wasn't quick and it wasn't easy. Um, it took a long time. 
So it's not always inst instant. And I had to do it over and over and over again. Um, and as you might be able to tell, it still upsets me just thinking about it. But forgiveness is not an option. I'm not qualified to pass judgment on that guy. Um, there's only one person who passes judgment, and that's God. And forgiveness has got to play a part in our relationships in church as well. Um, we will fall out. Everybody in a family falls out at some point. But we need to forgive really quickly and not let things hang on. And Jesus said that if you're bringing an offering to the temple and you know that you have something against your brother or sister, you should go to them and make your peace before giving your offering. Now, obviously, we don't do offerings apart from financial offering, but I think the equivalent now would be before taking the Lord's Supper, you know, the um, breaking bread. So if you've got anything against anybody in the church, go and make your peace before you do that. Okay, let's move on. Lead us not into temptation. This is, a, this is a difficult one, and there's a lot I could say about it, but I think it's clear from the Bible that God does not tempt us. Um, James, who was the brother of Jesus, says, When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. And James goes on later to say, Submit yourselves then to God, Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. And God actually even gives us a get-out clause. This is from 1 Corinthians 10. It says, So, if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Now, God has given us free will, hasn't he? If we choose to be tempted and to do what we know God doesn't want us to do, then because he loves us, God allows us to go the wrong way. He doesn't want a bunch of robots to be worshipped in him. He wants a relationship with you. We can't ever claim that we have fallen into temptation. You know, it's like, I've used this analogy before, like there's a great big hole in the floor there. And uh, I go walking towards it. Oh, fallen. Oh dear. No. I could see there was a great big hole. I walked around it, yeah? So we can't claim that we've fallen into temptation. Don't make that claim. Um, and I think when, when we pray, lead us not into temptation, it's really a confession of our weakness and our reliance on God. And we have the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit who's our helper and our guide if we choose not to listen to the Holy Spirit, the Bible says that we grieve him. And I don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. So, next bit. Deliver us from evil. I made this analogy a couple of weeks ago. It's, the coming of Jesus is a bit like D-Day when the Allies landed on the beaches. The next coming of Jesus is a bit like VE Day, Victory in Europe Day. In between, there's a battle still going on, and we're in that battle. So we need deliverance from evil. We need protection. And God has given us protection. Very famous passage uh, about the armour of God says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armour of God 
so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggles are not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armour of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, which, with, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for the Lord's people. So when you leave your house in the morning, Julia usually says to me, have you got your keys? Have you got your wallet? Have you got your coat? Have you got your umbrella? So you need all that, but also you need your armour. So don't forget to go out with your armour. Okay, right, the last bit, surprisingly, isn't there. <laughs> so, your kingdom come, your will be done. Um, we've had that. <laughs> and then we've got, yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. No, we haven't. Okay. Um, it seems to be, has been added by the early church fathers. It's like a response prayer. So we pray the Lord's Prayer and then we respond. Yeah. So this is the response to the Lord's Prayer and it's just tacked on to the end. Um, now the Bible was very clear about adding to or taking away the Word of God. Um, so although this isn't in Matthew or Luke's Gospels, um, there's something very much like it. Um, and it's from 1 Chronicles. It says, Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendour. For everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Amen. Yeah. And I think that's a good place to stop, apart from, of course, my usual summary. <laughs> so, to sum up, if you are a Christian, all your sins have been forgiven, but we need to ask for our sins to be forgiven every day. To develop our relationship with God, please don't start your prayer with a list of requests, or a list of your sins. You start our Father. Forgiving others is hard, but it's not an option. God doesn't tempt anyone. He even gives you a way out. And don't go around without your armour. We are in a battle. And remember, Jesus has the final victory over evil. Amen. Amen.